I'm delighted uh, to have Robert Pinsky back as uh, a guest on Economics Matters, the podcast. Uh, Robert, we have become uh, close friends uh, in a short period of time. I have to uh, tell everybody the background. Uh, I've been at VU for now 40 years. One, 1984. What time did, what year did you join BU? Uh, 1989. Okay, so we've overlapped a long time. Yes. And we just met each other a couple of years ago. And we really became close friends really within the last year, I would say. Yeah. And it was really through this podcast uh, that we became in my uh, newsletter because you were, so the history of, um, my being here is when I learned that Robert Pinsky was here, uh, I saw, thought, well, what a fantastic thing to do, uh, to, uh, opportunity to meet Robert Pinsky. And I uh, uh, was old enough at that point to have met a lot of pretty famous people like presidents, billionaires, lots of billionaires, actually. Uh, not that it did me financially any good to meet these people, but... Um, Senators and congressmen, I testified to Congress about 15 times uh, in the ensuing years. But there was uh, one person I was intimidated to meet. It was Robert Pinsky. And why was that? Well, I really had had no, you know, I felt I was like basically illiterate uh, from the perspective of, you know, literature that I hadn't really uh, ever absorbed poetry, knew anything about it. But just in general, hadn't read all the great books. I just didn't have that back that background. I was so busy working in economics and you know focused somewhat on politics. But uh, so I was always afraid to come to call Robert Pinsky and say let's grab lunch because so I didn't think I knew. I thought I would look like an imbecile. Anyway, Robert and I were both uh, uh, elected to a honorific position at Boston University. Uh, uh, and uh, we were forced to have dinner together. So that's where we, we met. And then I started this uh, newsletter and podcast. And because Robert was on my email list, uh, he started receiving it. And then he started writing back some comments. And then we started exchanging. And I figured, well, let me have Robert on my podcast when I started that. And then we, uh, and that was terrific. Uh, it was really about his new book called Jersey Breaks. It's about his history of... Uh, Growing Up in New Jersey, terrific book, a terrific podcast. It's at larrykotlikoff.substack.com. And you can sign up to be a member of that newsletter in the podcast and get that all for free. There's no charge required. You don't have to pay anything at larrykotlikoff.substack.com. So anyway, Robert and I are now routinely having lunch every month at our favorite Chinese restaurant in Cambridge. And... Meanwhile, uh, Robert's going through, you know, he's a, uh, a very young guy. He thinks he's, a little, some people think he's a little bit older than he is, uh, but he's like 40 going on 42. Uh, and he, he, always the, good to always hear the plain truth from yeah. an economist. Yeah, yeah. So I, I wanted to um, uh, just point out a couple um things that he's up to over the next month, uh, or actually over the next few weeks, he's going to be performing in Boston University at the um, uh, brand new uh, building. That if you drive along Common, Commonwealth Avenue in Boston, uh, you cannot, uh, but uh, you cannot miss this building. It's called the Computation Data Science Building. It's a huge modern uh, building with- uh, nicknamed, nicknamed the Jenga Building. The Jenga building. Okay, I guess Jenga gave us gave us the money. Um, anyway, on the on the eighth of February, oh, Jenga is the kids' game where the blocks stand way out of being in line with one another. Ah, oh, yeah, I got it. So yeah, it looks like a bookshelves uh, building. Um, one book uh, kind of sitting on top of another, sideways. Anyway, February eighth, Thursday, seven thirty p.m. Top of this fantastic building. Uh, Robert Pinsky, together with uh, one of Ireland's uh, top fiddlers, Martin Hayes, 
we'll be doing a combo of poetry and jazz and and I've seen one of these performances and that uh, Robert's done. It's just a fantastic combination of these two mediums. And then uh, the next day, the very next day um, in Kansas City, uh, Robert and Martin are going to be appearing at the 1900 building in Kansas City. So if you Google uh, Robert Pinsky, February 8th, uh, Martin Hayes, Boston University, you will come up with a, a way to get tickets. For, they're very inexpensive for the BU performance. And then uh, Google February 19th, 1900 building, a Kansas City, Robert Pinsky, and Martin Hayes, H-A-Y-E-S, P-I-N-S-K-Y. And you can go to one of those two. And if you're from out of town, fly in to hear them because it's worth it. Now, uh, today we're going to talk about two things. We're going to talk about that seem highly disconnected. Uh, first thing I'm going to say is just, uh, I'm going to try and keep this really quickly short because people can go online and find out about Robert Pinsky. If you go to, for example, the poetryfoundation.org, you'll see a, a bio of Robert Pinsky that will knock you off your your socks. Um, it just goes on and on about his contributions, not just to, his, uh, to poetry, but to making poetry real in the U.S. and make it a vital part of our uh, of our experience, of every American's experience, to really uh, bring poetry into everybody's lives. He's he's really um, done a huge amount because he was poet laureate. He felt this was his mission. He was poet laureate, which is an election by the U.S. Congress of the top poet in the U.S. And he was elected not just once, not just twice, but three times. So he served as poet laureate for three years. Nobody before Robert Pinsky had ever been poet laureate for um, more than one year. So that was quite a, uh, a, a compliment and a smart move by Congress. So just really shortly, he's an Amer a Roberts, an American poet, an essayist, a literary critic, and a translator. He was the first American, first US uh, poet laureate to serve three terms. He's recognized worldwide. Uh, Pinsky's work has earned numerous numerous accolades. He's a professor of English and creative writing in the graduate writing program at Boston University. Uh, he's a w William Fairfield Warren Distinguished Professor uh, at Boston University, and uh, that's like a university professor at, at our university. Uh, he he was born in Long Beach, New Jersey, hence uh, Trash. Trash Grapes, the, the title White Long Branch, not Long Beach. Yeah, a different place. I used to go to Long Beach as a kid. Long, we're both from New Jersey. Long Branch, New Jersey. Uh, and uh, he uh, attended uh, uh, Rutgers to get a BA. Then he went and got an MA and PhD from Stanford. And he's had all kinds of important positions uh, and finally ended up at the best place in the world, which is Boston University. Uh, and uh, to my great delight, Robert, uh, you wrote an op-ed yesterday in the New York Times uh, about the current discussion of on campus uh, about um, anti-Semitism and uh, and uh, and the re the reaction of three university presidents from the University of Pennsylvania, from Harvard, from MIT, to uh, questions about whether genocide was calling for genocide of Jews was acceptable language on campus, whether that falls under free speech or whether that should be banned. And uh, uh, that got two of those three presidents fired. It might lead to more firings. Uh, some of the other uh, presidents who have reacted uh, in ways that some members of Congress don't feel were sufficiently strong uh, may come under this may be like the McCarthy hearings of the 50s, where more and more academics are brought in to be chastised by members of Congress. Uh, and and Robert, you wrote a, a, an op-ed yesterday, which I would invite you perhaps to read or read part of it. It's called When Language Fails Us and the Moment. So we're gonna talk about this op-ed and then we're gonna talk about money, poetic money or poetic, poetry about money going back to 1540 and uh, 
what it what the connection is. So maybe uh, to start out, you could perhaps just uh, connect these two parts of this podcast. Uh, you're going to have this op-ed showed up in the New York Times yesterday to try and help people think a little bit differently about this um, uh, this controversy that we're you know people feel the presidents were not strong enough in responding. Uh, they were also trying to defend free speech and. Uh, the, the title again is When Language Fails Us and the Moment. And then we have these poets talking about money and uh, uh, and the friendships that it does and doesn't facilitate and, what, and whether that's... Uh, so give us the um, connections between these uh, two uh, contributions that you're going to give us today. Thank you, Larry. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here. And I'll try to connect more than two things. Uh, I want to address anybody who is asking, what is a poet doing on Larry Katlikoff's Economics Matters podcast, yeah. Yeah. What does economics have to do with poetry or poetry with economics? What does poetry have to do with money or money with poetry? What does an op-ed about current events have to do with those other two things. And I'll bring our friendship as fellow distinguished professors into it. It is always surprising and in another way predictable that important matters in politics, human relations, how we spend our time turn out to involve how you say it. And uh, as a reader of Money Magic, I know that there's a temptation in economics to rely on the most automatic, conventional, predictable, unexamined terms, and it always is a disaster in order to actually pay attention in matters of economics, it's necessary to be very demanding of yourself. The easy expressions always go wrong in the end. We like the easy because it seems safe, but the real difficulty is to find a plain, straightforward, accurate way to say anything. <laughs> I'm tempted I'm tempted to read the oldest poem in the collection we put together. Um, it's the voice of what, in my mind, is sort of like peasant wisdom or the wisdom of uh, my grandmother, the fool in King Lear, who tells King Lear, don't give everything away. Take care of yourself. Don't assume everything and everybody will be benign. That peasant wisdom of saying, Keep a little money aside and be a little prepared that something might go wrong. And Barnaby Googe in the 16th century wrote this poem. What is it? About 10 lines. The title of his poem is Of Money. Give money me. Isn't that a great three word beginning? Give money me. Take friendship, whoso list. For friends are gone come once adversity, while money yet remaineth safe in chest, that quickly can thee bring from misery. Fair face show friends when money doth abound. Again, just the rhythm and the compression. Fair face show friends when money doth abound. Come time of proof, farewell. They must away. Believe me well, they are not to be found if God but send thee once a lowering day. Gold never starts aside, but in distress finds ways enough to ease thine heaviness. <laughs> One of the great things that Gooch does in that very plain poem is convey without saying it that he says this with great regret and based on painful experience. He has seen and perhaps lived a bit of King Lear. And um, 
many people will know the Billy Holiday song. It's one of the songs that Billy Holiday wrote on the man named uh, Arthur Herzog. And uh, a wonderful passage in her poem is money. You've got plenty of friends that are crowding around the door. When you're gone, when money's gone and spending ends, they don't come around no more. Um, to be plain, another 16th century poem says, it is a precious jewel to be plain. That's true in academic life. It is true in politics. It is a truth that the speech writers and administrators for those college presidents should have had more in mind. It is a precious jewel to be plain. Wrote down that too is part of a great song, Fine Necks for Ladies. So I can put together Professor Kolokov and Kotlikoff and Professor Pinsky, I can put together the New York Times uh, op-ed and the poems. I can put together all these things with not being afraid of complexity and difficulty and finding a way to deal with it as plainly and directly as possible. And there's also in this... Um in that poem that you read and the other poems that you will read for us about the transformation of friends from one thing into another, uh, depending on the circumstances. Uh, and I think your op-ed is talking about, uh, in, in part about the transformation of meaning of words and also the way the words are expressed. Uh, you could say the right words with no expression and, uh, uh, come away with a very different meaning and what you can convey a very different meaning than uh, if you put them in a different way. Do you, do you have any, uh, do you think uh, reading your op-ed would be a good idea at this point? I'd be happy to do that. Um, I could also do, take one example from it. An example, I was again surprised. Um, I had noticed somewhere or other that it was considered much better when you write the word anti-Semitism, do not put in the hyphen. The hyphen is, is a bad thing uh, in relation to those old jokes, the ju old jokes. The hyphen is bad for the Jews. And even worse is to capitalize it, Semitic. And a very little research will remind you that the Oxford English Dictionary says, uh, Semitic, Semitic and semi often derogatory, <laughs> often derogatory. And a little more research shows that it's the crackpot science that took people like the composer Wagner and other people. Uh, the same crackpot science gave us the term Caucasian and the term Aryan which was considered a very important thing uh, for the Nazis, the Aryan type, the Aryan, the Caucasian, and even there is Hamidic. That's the Africans. They're descended from Ham, who did so, he was the son of Noah, who did something naughty. This, interestingly, that set of words is stupid, unreal, mistaken, poisonous, vague, completely discredited, goes back when people would measure people's heads and say what moral qualities went with what shape, brow. So on the one hand, it's to laugh. On the other hand, atrocious things have been perpetrated because of those ideas. Yeah, the eugen I just add to that the eugenicists of the 1880s and so, uh, that led to, you know, Hitler was a eugenicist, uh, obviously, but there were lots of very prominent people, uh, Mark Twain, to some extent, uh, the uh, uh, Irving Fisher, one of the top economists in the early 1900s, was a eugenicist. They believed possible that, Louis Agassiz at Harvard. It was believed possible. that uh, brain size uh, was 
yeah. was a sign of intelligence. Turns out that Einstein had a small brain. Yeah. Apparently lots of connections, but a small brain. But then the, the guy with the biggest brain, I did a little research for my book, I think it was for Money Magic. Uh, the guy with the biggest brains, his brain is actually, I think, viewable in at Cornell because he was in upstate New York. He could speak, or at least he claimed to be able to speak 34 languages. And I forget his exact name, but uh, nobody could knew the other languages to ch double check. But anyway, so he was a very big uh, uh, star, uh, intellectual, had friends like Mark Twain. And then they found out that he was a serial killer. Yeah. And uh, and he was arrested, eventually found. And uh, they had people like Mark Twain were trying to get him out of jail, appealing for his release because he was such a genius, apparently. Or they, you know, and uh, they executed him and then they dissected his body and preserved his brain. So uh, anyway, <laughs> I thought that would be a little interesting little tidbit there. But there is and that period of plausible baloney that had disastrous con consequences for the world. And the point of my piece, I didn't write the headline about language failing us. That's the Times wrote the headline. My headline would have been something like language is haunted. And yeah, let's read, let's, 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 if you're okay with it, let's have you read the pay, the piece, the sure. title of which is uh, when language fails us and the moment and uh, this is, a, of course, the titles for op-eds are given by the editors of yes. the newspapers. So that's not Robert's title, but but uh, yeah, take it away. Because I, there's so many interesting parts to this. And one of the things about this is it deserves and needs to be reread about 10 times, which is Robert was kind enough to send it to me as he was writing it, different drafts and uh, uh, sending me the exchange back and forth with the editor of the New York Times, it was clear that she was kind of like, I thought she was like doing a, a quick read or it seemed like she was doing a quick read. And then she kind of, I think after some effort, it sunk in what you were trying to get across. And part of what you're trying to convey here is that the effort of understanding uh, is part of the process of understanding, is, is required, that the words themselves without somebody kind of work it's work yeah. and it's work i thank you for helping me uh, make the piece better i'm also grateful to the editor at the time she turned out to be quite sensitive perceptive reader i'm very grateful to her she uh along with you ellen pinsky various writer friends helped with this here it is I begin, a writer I admire expresses in a few words his disdain for plausible but empty political language. He begins with one good example, quote, the word fascism, he writes, has now no meaning except insofar as it signifies something not desirable. He adds other exhausted words, including democracy, freedom, and patriotic, convenient terms for establishing righteousness, easily melting into self-righteousness. The writer is George Orwell. In his celebrated 1946 essay, Politics and the English Language, Orwell contends that language in his time had become corrupt and debased, in his time, but the survival of his examples into the present contradicts him, suggesting that not only the problem, but the very examples may be timeless. Plain, direct language remains rare, desirable, and risky in ways that authority Risky in ways that authority, even more than the rest of us, tries to avoid. In the recent kerfuffle, a politician asked three university presidents, did a call for the genocide of, the, the genocide of Jews violate codes against bullying and harassment at their schools? The responses to that question, 
almost identical, have been condemned as canned, legalistic, evasive, bland, jargon-ridden, and possibly anti-Semitic. Okay, then, I've said to myself, what would have been better than the cautious baloney? What would have been better than that cautious baloney, Robert? What would you do? In the spirit of Orwell, maybe I'd criticize the interrog interrogator's language, something like, Congresswoman, on my campus, we take bullying and harassment quite seriously with enforced rules against them. But I am shocked that you put these be those behaviors in the same sentence as a word meaning the systematic extermination of an entire population. How can you compare the meaning of that word with its ongoing murderous history to unacceptable behavior on our campus? Well, that fantasy of a response, maybe not bad, certainly not great, shows some of the difficulties that a follower of Orwell might face. In his essay, Orwell quotes from the great 17th century English translation of some biblical lines in Ecclesiastes, quote, I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise, which Orwell converts into modern English, quote, Objective consideration of contemporary phenomena compels the conclusion that success or failure in competitive activities exhibits no tendency to communicate with innate capacity. A parody, Orwell calls this transformation, but not a very gross one. This goes back to my saying that uh, Complexity alienates people, and authority is afraid of it. Not long ago, I showed that passage where instead of the race doesn't go to the swift, says uh, uh, the uh, commensurate uh, athletic proficiency falls in considerably. Blah, 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 blah. I showed that passage to an intelligent, well-educated person much younger than me. He understood our well's intention, but he confessed he found the parody with its colorless, long polysyllabic words easier to understand. He might have said more accessible, easier to live with than the plain words of the original, like bread and swift and strong. Dilution of meaning we may not confess that it pleases us, but dilution of meaning is familiar in a way that can make us feel comfortable or even worse, comfortably righteous. That's a feeling that those university presidents or their script writers possibly were hoping to evoke. The reliably available terms of disapproval and approval, genocide and patriotism, anti-Semitism, and democracy convey large scale and importance, but sometimes they convey large scale and importance while avoiding the heavy cost of paying actual attention. And I'm hoping that's a principle in economics and other sciences and social sciences, as well as life the cost of paying actual intention. The more important the word, the more its meaning may be a matter of degree, from not much to quite a lot. The attainment of meaning requires work. The attainment of meaning requires work, and the more important the meaning, the harder the work. Language is haunted. Then comes the second half of the piece. Here are a few Jewish examples. Wisps of meaning, not to condemn, but to recognize, 
Now I'll pause for a moment to say what I've been implying, uh, what I implied a minute ago as part of uh, Larry's podcast, was that oddly enough, the word anti-Semitism, because of what it comes from, anti-Semitism as a word is kind of, or maybe a little bit, or could be accused of being sort of anti-Semitic. <laughs> it's based in terrible language, and it's in a way a euphemism for Jew-hating. I'll go on. The word anti-Semitism in the spelling I just used without a hyphen is considered preferable because anti-Semitism, or even worse, anti-Semitism, capital S, implies the legitimacy of a discredited racialist set of ideas, an old quasi-scholarly, pseudo-scholarly notion that has come in the same swamp as the term Aryan or the capital A. So even the hyphen, the minimal blip of punctuation, conveys into the present its tiny little cargo, its cargo of historical ghosts and violations. Paragraph. I never see anymore the phrase Jews and minorities. You do to see that in the paper, we'd say Jews and minorities. Good riddance to those well-meaning words that used to give me, along with others, in the roughly 2.4% of the U.S. population who were Jews, two-tenths of a percent of the world. I can thank my friend Kotlikoff for those precise percentages. It can cause a wincing chuckle. Even the legitimate standard issue phrase, people of color, raises its teeny backwash. Possibly some people who say people of color use the phrase not realizing that Jews were not white people in our country until quite recently. Thus, at some point, neither white nor people of color. Certainly, that's been true in times and places. When I lived in the town Wellesley, Mass, as a college teacher, my family and I had faculty housing. Thanks to that fringe benefit, we didn't have to worry that at least some of Wellesley's residential neighborhoods were said to be restricted by a real estate provision that forbade selling to Jews. A covenant, right? That's what they called it. And it has, again, language. Covenant sounds kind of biblical. <laughs> and it had this... Uh, Ordained by God, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so uh, maybe I've I've read enough of this to get the idea across. Uh, I end by noting, which is true, when I taught at Wellesley College, one of the very first pieces of mail I got from the college uh, said that the trustees of Wellesley had voted to uh, revise the charter of Wellesley College, and they changed it so that it no longer said that Wellesley faculty will be Christian men and women. And uh, I end the piece saying, uh, I joked to myself, phew, just in time. And uh, the closing sentence of the piece is, in the haunted house of our language, surrounded by the desperate fogs of disapproval and righteousness. I was picturing a cinematic scene from Frankenstein's castle or something all the fog around it. A flicker of comedy may signal the step in the right direction, not to forbid the ghosts, but to check them out. So I'm not saying we must never say anti-Semitism anymore, but just notice with amusement and attention that uh, our standard term that we accept and adapt and uh, use in good causes uh, is haunted by nastiness. And uh, it's not so much, I've always disliked Ezra Pound's formula that the poet will purify the language of the tribe. Purify and tribe both have always been sort of unpleasant words to me. But um, a good writer of any kind 
including a poet who often has nothing but writing as his resources or her resources. Um, pay attention. Well, this is a, an op-ed that's very, you know, of all the op-eds that you may read this year in any newspaper or any uh, uh, website, this is one of the the more challenging because it, it forces you to do the work to, to think, but to connect the parts. Uh, but there are deep messages in each sentence and combination. I'd be sympathetic to a reader who said, oh my God, is he saying I can't even say anti-Semitism? <laughs> yeah, I mean... And I'm not for you, being anything, but I'm saying... Right, we, we've we gone from Negro to, to African American to Black to... And even before Negro, we had another word that is not pronounceable, is not sayable. Well, I can remember when I was very young, person of color, people of color, was this rather offensive euphemism of color didn't sound good. But these things, usage has its wisdom. So that because it's what we have all somewhat agreed on, we say anti-Semitism, we say people of color. Um, it's it's a it's a it's, it's no, a we created statement this. of pride today that yeah, I'm a person to some of extent. Color. But we right. and our ancestors made these things, and just like our vehicles and our electric power plants and our oil exploration, we make them, and when they go wrong or we can improve upon them, we change them, and. To make believe they're eternal is a mistake. That's right. Yeah. Now, something that seems more eternal to, in contrast, is money, because money and the relationship of re relationships with money, uh, or through via money, seems to be going back forever. I mean, five the year fifteen oh four. Bring us to uh, to the present with. Uh, one of the other poems that you, uh, you know, showed me uh, that you might want to uh, recite today. Well, I could read the poem that may be the first poem I recited to you, Provide, Provide. Is that yeah. repetitious? Um, I remember uh, when I was reading poems for the News Hour, then the News Hour with Jim Lehrer uh, in the 80s when there was a terrific, uh, was it the 80s? Anyway, there's a terrific... Uh, the stock market plunged, and uh, to cover that story as decoded to the news hour, I read a poem that has the words stock market in it. Quite a good poem. Provide, provide. The witch that came, the withered hag, to wash the steps with pale and rag, was once the beauty Abishag, the princess, the picture pride of Hollywood. Too many fall from great and good for you to doubt the likelihood. Die early and avoid the fate, or if predestined to die late, make sure that you can die in state. <laughs> make the whole stock exchange your own, and if need be, acquire a throne where nobody can call you crone. Some have relied on what they knew, and some on simply being true. What worked for them might work for you. No memory of having starred atones for later disregard, or keeps the end from being hard. Better to go down dignified, with bought in friendship at your side, than none at all. Provide, provide. <laughs> That's um, marvelous. Now, who was that? Who is this going back to 1504 as well? No, that's uh, that poem's probably written in about 1954. That's Robert Frost, uh, who Robert Frost Frost. In stereotype is uh, a sweet old grandpa with sweet things to say. And in fact, as people who really love his poetry knows, no, he was. Uh, a dark, cussed, uh, mischievous character uh, 
as in that poem, which surprisingly liked the 16th century poems, rather liked Barnaby Googe. And did, said, did, did you ever meet Frost? Um, very briefly, yeah. Not so count. I knew my friend, the painter, uh, uh, Michael Mazur, saw a lot of them. Mike was at Amherst. Frost visited Mike's fraternity house quite often. Uh, and I have had a lot of people who were part of that Amherst, Dartmouth, that New England thing. No, I met Frost very briefly uh, at Stanford and other places. But no, not really. Mm -hmm. I remember going to a reading he gave at Rutgers and being very disappointed by what I thought was uh, an anti-intellectual current in what he had to say, that he was playing to the audience, uh, making fun of young literary snobs like me. I was an 18-year-old or 19-year-old, uh, very uh, serious, excessively uh, self-serious. Uh, uh, so I should have listened more and disapproved less. That's my personal memory of Frost. I'm not particularly yeah. proud of it. The, um, uh, so we have some other poems uh, from Shakespeare and uh, yeah. from, and later. Sure. Uh, the it'd be great to have you um, recite. But I guess the question the question I want to uh, make sure that I ask is whether you see any. Uh, any connections that I haven't raised between this contemporary, uh, 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 let's say, uh, I don't, I don't, difficulty with language that we're uh, experiencing, people, people, uh, uh, I wouldn't say mis misusing, but um, uh, you know, not. You know, they're, they're worried about their use of language. Let me put it that way. Language is a danger. Language is haunted. Language has men, men, multiple meanings. Uh, you're worried about what pronouns you're using these days, what you're not using. Uh, is there some broader uh, guidance here that uh, we should be, you know, following uh, as we deal with deal with this? Uh, the next university professor who a president who is brought in front of Congress uh, to uh, respond to that question. Uh, uh, well, you did give an answer about how that how that response should go, which was to to fight back to say, "Look, uh, let's think about this. There's freedom of speech, but there's also common sense here that uh, you 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 can't um, equate." Uh, certain statements with you know calling for genocide is a whole different ballpark than than protesting uh what's going on in gaza perhaps if uh, i'm answering the question that i think you're asking i don't believe that hypocrisy manipulation fearfulness stumbling because of uh uncertainty were invented recently. They're eternal. The exception is truth, directness, understanding, attention. That's what we strive for, to be exception. You know how many science search sequences were written in the 1590s? Hundreds, hundreds of science sequences. And it was a fashion. Language was very important in people who were in or wanted to ape the ruling class. In the court, in the Elizabethan court, two very important things were investing a lot of money in lace and uh, silk and moths and all sorts of things, and being able to write sonnets, language, showing off in language. And of most of that showing off, like most of the things written and devised today, was forgettable, temporary, too slavish to what was going on. They were all imitating one another. And a few of them, I mean, Shakespeare's sonnet sequence has a lot of mediocrity in it. Some of them are really great. And the one I was thinking about in relation to our subject, there's language all through it of uh, this account, the sad account, 
I knew pay as if not paid, grievance, long since canceled. In this language of canceling and uh, waste, it's all the very first line, familiar line, went to the sessions. The sessions, these all are legalistic. They all sound like they have to do with uh, lawsuits involving money. And he uses those terms to do with money to think about his own precious quality of attention. You can't take either one with you. <laughs> We're all going to die quite soon. We live for an eye blink. And uh, yet we waste our attention as though we also might be wasting our other kinds of value. I suppose value is another word that uh, concerns what you do and what I do. When to the sessions of sweet, silent thought, I summon up remembrance of things past. I sigh the lack of many a thing I sought, and with old woes knew well my dear time's waste. Then can I drown an eye, unused to flow for precious friends hid in death's stateless night, and weep afresh love's long since cancelled woe, and moan the expense and mother, the expense of many a vanished sight. The way he does the repetitions in the next quadrant is just so cunning. So, then can I grieve at grievances foregone and heavenly from woe to woe tell o'er the sad account of poor bemoaned bone. Forgive me for getting a bit professorial or technical, but grieve, grieve, moan, moan. Then can I grieve that grievances foregone and heavily from woe to woe tell o'er the sad account of four bemoaned moan, which I knew pay as if not paid before. But if the while I think on thee, dear friend, all losses are restored and sorrows end. So in the couple, he kind of says he becomes sane after this waste, time wasting. Uh, paying what's already been paid. Weep afresh, love's long since canceled. Whoa. And uh, there were uh, many dozens of people who tried to do things like take the language of the of, uh, chancery court and use it for your emotional life. And uh, he really was quite good at it. Right. So he's talking about repaying... Uh... Basically, regret spending yes. spending time spending time uh, uh, lamenting as opposed to uh, at the end uh, uh, talking about um, which the I point. knew pay which I knew pay as if I it, as yeah. if not paid before. Yeah, that you know again here, here you have to read this carefully and with thought, and you have to do the work. Uh, and it can't just be bland. Uh, it depends on the context, which is what the presidents were basically fired for. They re they quoted, they said that genocide, use of the word genocide depends on the, whether that's permissible depends on the context. Well, uh, obviously it does depend on the context at some level. If you're talking about the genocide in a history class uh, of Jews or of Native Americans, but if you're in a protest calling for genocide, it's very different. But unless you make things explicit, um, poor people, they just were victims of the of the tendency to have far too many administrators and advisors. And uh, if you want to have something said very well, one person has to say it. Try to have to, three other people as you do it. And you have to case, you have to know what you're what you're going to say. I was there are three very competent, very well educated, very. Uh, decent people talking a lot of crap because they had taken the same kind of advice from there being too many people who give that kind of advice. If they had thought about reality, each of them would have had a very good answer, I'm convinced, for the manipulative, also kind of shallow, silly question they were asked. Uh, but there were too many hands working on it, and that spoiled the broth.
they were kind of lost in their words, maybe as a way to... Or not <laughs> lost in words that were not really theirs, except in the plural. Lost in the worlds in the words of the sub-assistant provostal dean for testimony before Congress and his staff of assistants who help with that. Of course, it's going to come out being dopey. Yeah, <laughs> I know. And when you're testifying to Congress, you have to be aggressive because the members of Congress, you're either invited by the Republicans or the Democrats, and the other side is out to get you uh, or not paying attention. So you have to say, Congressman X or Congressperson X, uh, listen to this. This is for you. And don't don't ignore what I'm saying just because you the other side invited me. It's not easy. I very carefully say, and after I give my answer, I, I'm careful in the op-ed to say, oh, it's maybe not bad, but it's not great. And uh, it's not easy to do what they were asked to do. And uh, unfortunately, they relied on a very good committee of people with a lot of qualifications, far too many experts conferring with one another. And sometimes it just needs to be somebody who really knows what they're talking about. And I think each of them did. And so Jack, Jack Gilbert. Been, you're right about aggressive. It shouldn't have been that hard to say, Congresswoman, you're asking to compare the rules about bullying on a college campus with right. genocide, really? Yeah. <laughs> yes. They're not. What are yeah. you doing? But yeah. you're, I don't want to make it sound easy. But really, everything I've had to say to you, Larry, is it's my sermon against what's easy. Right. So t let's, let's finish up today with... Um, uh, Jack Gilbert, the poet who lived from 1925 to 2012. Yes. Uh, a brief for the defense. And maybe this brings us uh, some, this is easily something that can both depress and elate uh, and uh, send us on our way to, um, to think. I think it's... Uh, I did yeah. know Jack Gilbert. I think in a way he is, again, he's being realistic. He's being plain. And he's saying, let's not pretend everything is worse than it really is. It's a difficult thing to say. The poem right. for me is the opposite of easy, as the title implies. By Jack Gilbert, a brief for the defense. Sorrow everywhere. Slaughter everywhere. If babies are not starving someplace, they are starving somewhere else, with flies in their nostrils. But we enjoy our lives, because that's what God wants. Otherwise, the mornings before summer dawn would not be made so fine. The Bengal tiger would not be fashioned so miraculously well. The poor women at the fountain are laughing together, the poor women at the fountain are laughing together between the suffering they have known and the awfulness in their future, smiling and laughing, while somebody in the village is very sick. There is laughter every day in the terrible streets of Calcutta, and the women laugh in the cages of Bombay. If we deny our happiness, resist our satisfaction, we lessen the importance of their deprivation. We must risk delight. We can do without pleasure, but not delight, not enjoyment. We must have the stubbornness to accept our gladness in the ruthless furnace of this world. To make injustice the only measure of our attention is to praise the devil. If the locomotive of the Lord runs us down, we should give thanks that the end had magnitude. <laughs> we must admit there will be music despite everything. We stand at the prow again of a small ship anchored late at night in the tiny port looking over to the sleeping island. The waterfront is three shuttered cafes and one naked light burning. To hear the faint sound of oars in the silence as a rowboat comes slowly out and then goes slowly back 
is truly worth all the years of sorrow that are to come. Yes, uh, that's that's a beautiful poem. Uh, that's that's something for the ages, no question. Um, well, Robert, uh, any final thoughts uh, before we? Uh, uh, I want to, of course, remind everybody at Boston University on February eighth. At uh, you can Google that. Uh, at uh, with Martin Hayes. This is a combination. This is something that. Uh, uh, Will delight your. Uh, he's a great. Away the devil, a brief for the uh, defense. Jack he, Elder would love this. Guitar. He works with the guitarist Kyle Sana, and uh, I'm looking. It's getting so soon. It's a week from this coming Thursday, I believe. We must admit that there will be music. That we must admit there will be music despite everything. Yes. And Robert is combining music, fabulous music, with poetry at these two events. And again. It's uh, February 8th, uh, Boston University with Martin Hayes and uh, uh, 7.30 p.m. And then on the 9th, the very next day, Robert's going to hop on a plane and fly all the way to Kansas City and do the same show with uh, Martin at uh, yeah. 1900 Building, Kansas City. So please try and... They're sister yeah. arts, poetry and music are sister arts, and their cousin is economics. <laughs> distant cousin well maybe not so distant after today uh any any parting words uh for the masses i you know uh i i'm delighted that you wrote your op-ed for the new york times because i think uh the uh so much of our inability to talk is because we are using words differently uh and we are hung up on words and if you don't say exactly the right words the right way uh, you can't communicate. You're immediately put into shunned off into uh, the other side. Uh, we could try the tribe, the tribe uh, that's and not your tribe. Maybe my parting words should be to recommend uh, George Orwell's essay "Politics and the English Language." It gives good advice and it makes it clear that our problems are not new. And let me make my parting words that I recommend. Uh, Robert Pinsky's uh, when, when Language Fails Us and the Moment uh, for everyone to read. It's uh, available at the New York Times op-ed from yesterday. Uh, it's not often that the New York Times publishes uh, anything from a poet, let alone um, even the uh, a three-time poet laureate. So it's worth... Um, you're reading, rereading, and working on because it has insight after insight. So thank you again, Robert. This has been yet again another delight. We will continue with the having you on the podcast. You're now a regular. <laughs> and uh, I will uh, be sitting in the audience on February 8th uh, uh, to delight in the music. And uh, thank you, Larry. Thank, thank you. Thanks.